my dear sisters and brothers in the redeeming Christ. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ is a historical event that took place more than 2000 years ago. But it is not a museum piece or even a diamond that we take out and polish on Good Friday every year and then put it back. It is not meant to be a soulful or a mournful occasion of sighing and breast beating at how poor Jesus suffered so much. The passion of Jesus is to be identified today in the lives of those who suffer. It could be me, it could be you. But it goes the other way as well. Others could be suffering in their lives, their passion, because of you, because of me. The passion continues even today. The same cast of characters, then as it is now. We are not in a museum. This is the reality of life. There is the opportunity and to see our call to be the various characters that were unfolded in this gospel narrative. Simon of Cyrene, the women of Jerusalem, the beloved disciple, Mary. However, it's easier to point a finger at Pilate or Herod or Judas or Annas or Caiaphas, the soldiers, the high priests. But I must hold a mirror to myself. The passion as it is unfolding today is a reality check as to where I stand and where do I take a stand. And as we look at some of the gospel characters, let us see how it is played out in our lives. You take a look at the chief priests. They might have been well-meaning persons, but not all good intentions and pious practices are healthy. Their image of God, their brand of religion, was a result of a twisted understanding of the image of God. In spite of being religious persons, they condemned more than being compassionate. They had more pride than patience. The problem is not God or religion, but the way we understand, interpret and practice our faith and the way we understand God and our image of God. Then we have Pilate. He played around with the truth and justice because he lived for personal gain, perhaps, for status, for privilege, for position, for power. A number of political leaders today line up to take the title of pilot. They choose to wash their hands, sometimes in blood. When a nation does not follow democratic principles and institutions, when leaders don't take a stand in conscience for the truth, when those in power seek to divide groups in society on the basis of religion and language and region and ideology and culture, when the sole aim of some leaders is to win elections and promote their friends rather than work for the good of all the people, there are many successors to Pilate. But not just in politics. We have such persons in society, the family, and yes, even the church. Those who refuse to live their responsibility. They wash their hands. They want the title and position, but not the responsibility and accountability. Persons are entrusted with responsibility in families and society and the church, but they could live irresponsible lives. Fathers and mothers fail to accompany their children. Husbands and wives who live in misery and don't seek help. Children who make demands on their parents and even as adult children refuse to assume the responsibilities of the home and family. Washing hands of your responsibility comes so easily to some. And when that happens, Pilate lives in us and through us, even today. Simon of Cyrene, a simple passerby, was dragged in to help. Unexpected, 
but thrown into the heart of action. Doesn't it happen to us sometimes? What might appear as an accident, a stroke of luck, a coincidence, is actually the hand of God's providence, or what we would call God incidence. More than Simon helping Jesus with the cross, his act of helping helped Simon himself, and he was blessed to give rather than just receive. We take a look at Peter, a man with good intentions, a good faith, but he was weak. He denied not once or twice, but three times. It was a pattern in his life. We ask ourselves, is there any pattern of wrongdoing in my life? Lying, cheating, unfaithfulness, acting out of anger or hatred, throwing the past at people, trying to get even with them, revengeful. The look of Jesus evoked repentance in Peter. And Jesus looks at you too. His loving look, especially in confession, renews you. Because we have a God who is scandalously merciful, shamelessly forgiving, generously loving, but prophetically challenging. We take a look at Nicodemus. The first time he comes to Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 2, he comes at night. Because perhaps he doesn't want to be seen with this rebel prophet. What would the other members of the Jewish council think? And then, but at the end, in the gospel today, he literally comes out of the darkness, into the light. Because Nicodemus has experienced Jesus, who is the light. What about you and me? Where are we in this faith journey? Some have moved into a deeper faith. Others are quite content to remain with the catechism they got at Sunday school, nothing more. And as a result, they remain just cultural Christians who put an attendance in the church now and then. The question is, like Nicodemus, Am I taking concrete steps in my faith journey? We look at Joseph of Arimathea, a respected official, a man of economic means. He had the financial foresight to even prepare a tomb when he died. But he knew that he was merely a steward of the resources that he was blessed with. He made it available to others. Of course, he did not quite know that Jesus would use that tomb only for the weekend. But his heart was bigger than his purse. Not all generosity has to do with money. But we can have a generous spirit of availability, of proactive thoughtfulness, of sharing our skills and our experience with others. The question is, is there a Joseph of Arimathea lurking within you? Let this come to life in you. We take a look at the women of Jerusalem. In the midst of a jeering mob, they dared to take sides with Jesus. Rabbis at that time never had women disciples. Jesus had. It is not easy for women to assert their rightful place of equality and dignity in a terribly loaded man's world of patriarchy. And unless we men decide to correct the social and cultural injustice, we perpetuate a privileged life for the men and the boys. Then we have the violent mob. Some have the courage to do evil in a group. Take a look at the rioters, those who lynch people, the gang rapists, funks and cowards, but they have somehow the courage, false courage in a group. But not all violence is with blood. It's expressed in different ways. Peer group pressure in schools and colleges and young people. Ah, oh, so you still believe. 
So you still go to church. Keeping up with the neighbors. Fall in line if you are to be accepted. Be part of the gang. Don't be old fashioned. Just be cool. Are we part of the mob mentality? Then there are the indifferent but guilty bystanders. Those who give their consent by silence. Those who never budge as long as the blows fall on someone else. Those who have no answer or opinion on disputed questions that affect the church, the society, the constitution and our country. Those who let things go their own way. Those without whom not much evil would have been done because the wickedness of the few finds security in the cowardice of the many. Before how many injustices and dramas have we shown this criminal indifference? And when we choose to stay silent when others suffer, there will be none left to stand for us when we suffer. Then, of course, there is Mary. She stood beside Jesus at Cana at the start of his ministry. Now she stands beside Jesus in Calvary at the foot of the cross in solidarity. Her son was suffering. She stood at the foot of the cross and she could do nothing. She couldn't moisten his lips, which were dry. She couldn't wipe the wounds from which blood was streaming. She couldn't take off the nails from his hand. It looks like she could do nothing. But yet, because she stood by the cross, she did everything. In solidarity. In life, sometimes we feel so helpless, so impotent. Sometimes all we can do is stand by people. We take a stand for them in solidarity. It costs. It costs to stand for people, to stand for truth, to stand for justice. How ready are we to accompany people in their pain, their difficulty, their sorrow, their grief in the time of their death? Mary was there to help. Mary is perpetual help and she shows us how a model disciple and missionary. So this passion story is a life. It's today. It is now. Let us be brutally frank and starkly honest with ourselves. Not the position of blaming others or seeing others worse than I am and always painting myself as truly right. Self-righteousness. Any self-delusion to see myself better than I really am. Let us stop being selfish or narcissist. Because a narcissist will be the last to admit that he or she is one. Some play the blame game because then I don't have to change but the others have. They have to. Then of course there are violent abuses. Sometimes it's physical, emotional, financial or sexual we get such predators who will not even admit to the evil that they are responsible for. The passion story throws a mirror at us. I must be judged not by the sp sweet words I say, but my attitude and my behavior. How well do I walk the talk? Do I practice what I preach? Do I live what I proclaim? In the family, how do you come across? To your spouse, to your children, to your neighbors, in your parish. Are you compassionate or are you cruel? Are you a saint outside but a devil at home? The passion throws a mirror at us. Because the passion is here. The passion is now. Calvary or Golgotha is not just a historical reality. It is happening today. Jesus is hanging on the cross. His eyes look feverishly at those around this cross. So in the silence of our heart, for a few moments, let this question be with me that haunts me 
through these days of sacred mystery. Because around the cross, the many characters, where do I place myself? Where do I stand among all the characters? And with whom do I stand?